This video documents racist language, imagery, and history. July 22, 1906. Things were not looking good for Alexander Satterwhite. It was the early evening. The African-American businessman stood at the center of a crowd on the white pillared porch of Judge Loughborough's house on River Road in Montgomery County, Maryland. He was accused of selling real estate without a license, a charge that carried a penalty of up to $30,000, equivalent to about $800,000 today. A.L. Satterwhite had plainly violated the law in selling the Belmont lots without a license as a real estate broker. It was reported in a Washington Times article from July 22, 1906. We can't know what was going through Satterwhite's head, but to give you an image, it had only been 10 years since Sidney Randolph became the last man lynched in Montgomery County. But once the trial began, things started going Satterwhite's way. Attorney Dawson eloquently submitted that no man could be prohibited from selling his own property. The justice did not have to consult the statutes. He ruled offhand and dismissed the warrant. The Times reported. But when Satterwhite was released, the town marshal of Somerset immediately rearrested him for selling real estate on the Sabbath. That charge was also dismissed. This incident is just one chapter of a much larger story. Satterwhite and his three African-American business partners, Charles Cuny, James Neal, and Michel Dumas, were doing something cutting edge for its time, selling lots in a 31-acre section of land known as Belmont to other African-Americans so, that, so they could build exclusive homes. This is the story of the Belmont Syndicate, their ambitious plan, and how it was thwarted by racial discrimination. This is also a story of how the winners write history, how white developers not only stopped the project from succeeding, but were also able to erase it from our collective memories, even as our physical environment still contains remnants and breadcrumbs of the truth. The subdivision of Belmont was located just on the other side of the northwest border of Washington, D.C. Zooming in, Belmont would have been between what is now Chevy Chase and Friendship Heights, an expensive residential and commercial area. Now it is filled with big apartment buildings, but at the turn of the 20th century, these streets were dotted by Victorian homes and surrounded by farmland. On June 16, 1906, Satterwhite, together with Neil, Cuny, and Dumas, formed the Belmont Syndicate under an agreement to hold the piece of land in trust for all four of them. They agreed not to do anything to the land without the approval of the others, and that sale proceeds were only to be used for their own benefit and divided among them in the same ratio as their individual contributions. This pact would make them part of the history of suburbanization in the United States. The Belmont Syndicate came from a range of backgrounds typical of professional African-American men in turn-of-the-century D.C. At 44 years old, Satterwhite was the most established. Born near Oxford, North Carolina, he moved to D.C. around 1890 with some financial means. Before Belmont, he had operated a pool hall and opened several restaurants. Earlier in 1906, he had started the A.L. Satterwhite & Co., a real estate and lending practice. Dumas, a 38-year-old ear, nose, and throat doctor who dabbled in real estate, was born outside Huma, Louisiana. He attended Leland College and Fisk University before earning an M.D. and pharmacy degree from Howard University. Before he received his medical license, he worked at the Pension Bureau and then taught at Friedman's Hospital. By 1905, he was earning as much as $4,000 annually, a six-figure salary in 2021. 39-year-old James Lincoln Neal was born to Friedman Farmers near Rogersville, Tennessee. After receiving a BA from Fisk University, he relocated to DC, where he found work as a copyist in the Pension Bureau. He then graduated from Howard's pharmacy program and received a Master's of Law, which was a sufficient credential to pass the bar in practice. After some failed entrepreneurial ventures, Neil joined his law school classmate, L. Melendez King, to sell real estate. He was financially insolvent and deeply in debt to Dumas by 1905, with liens on his properties. Charles Cuny, the youngest of the group at 27, had a different route to D.C. From Houston, he had had a privileged upbringing as the son of a Republican Party official and the nephew of the most prominent African American in Reconstruction, Texas, Norris Wright Cuny. He would later attend Howard Law School, but at the time he was working as an auditor in the post office. His father had attempted to build an African-American town near Galveston, but we haven't been able to find much about it. 
Belmont had a very complicated title. The Chevy Chase Land Company packaged it separately from other neighboring parcels they planned for high-end residential development and sold the subdivision to a group of investors led by Ralph Barnard and Guy Johnson in 1903. Barnard and Johnson prepared a subdivision plat and sold it to a man named William Sheets, who claimed to represent a Philadelphia investor. In fact, Sheets represented someone closer to home, the Belmont Syndicate. In a series of rapid transactions on June 28, 1906, some of the most valuable land in the D.C. suburbs were all of a sudden owned by four African-American men. The syndicate had plans for Belmont. They widely advertised it in both white and black newspapers, and it was written up in publications like the Washington Bee. Colored people, attention! Read one ad in the Washington Post. A chance is offered to you to buy an ideal suburban lot in the most beautiful and most rapidly improving section of Northwest Washington, Belmont Chevy Chase. Another stated, It is the only good subdivision in Washington where colored people are welcome to buy. There was something special about D.C. that allowed the Belmont Syndicate to, to believe that four black men could build a black suburb in the exclusive Northwest of the city, even as Jim Crow settled in. As Chris Myers Ash and Derek Musgrove note in their history of Washington, D.C., called Chocolate City, during and following Reconstruction, D.C. had more intelligent, cultured, well to do colored people than any other American city, and was renowned as the capital of the black elite. In a post Civil War era that lasted longer in D.C. than in other places, black citizens had access to stable professional jobs, like in the vast, newly formed, integrated federal civil service and a strong educational system, including institutions like Howard University. DC's upwardly mobile black citizens lived in the brick row houses of the Logan Circle and Shaw neighborhoods. The wealthiest lived close to the newest affluent area in the city, DuPont Circle. The most successful had multiple revenue streams. Elizabeth Dowling Taylor writes in the original Black Elite that, Those in the black upper class who had achieved substantial wealth had done so not by earning their daily bread, but through real estate, construction, and other financial ventures. As the streetcar suburbs around D.C. developed, it follows that D.C.'s black aristocracy would expand their investments beyond the city lines. Belmont drew from this population. We were able to pinpoint at least 28 buyers of Belmont lots, and they form a snapshot of the hope, upward mobility, and decline of opportunity for D.C.'s African-American community between the Civil War and Jim Crow. Alexander Oglesby was a Civil War veteran serving as a private in the 14th U.S. Colored Infantry Company F out of Chattanooga, Tennessee, and served as personal messenger for General Henry Clark Corbin during the war and then for the rest of his career. Oglesby was active in numerous military veterans associations for the rest of his life. Belmont was not Oglesby's first interaction with the members of the syndicate. He had previously been in business with Neil. In fact, many of the lot buyers were connected to each other. Neil's brother Lewis and sister Elizabeth Haney bought lots, as did Martha Claggett, who later married Dumas. Claggett was supported by a good civil service job, serving as the clerk of the Bureau of Fisheries steamer RV Albatross, which was the first vessel built especially for marine research by any government. Notably, Claggett signed her contract as a single woman. Martha Lee, Lucy F. Campbell, and Sarah Hall all likely did as well. At one point, Andrew Mickens lived in a house owned by Lemuel Beckett's mother, and his wife shared her maiden name with another buyer, Lucius Foley, who may have been a relative. George Lafayette Walton likely knew CUNY because both were members of the prestigious Pen and Pencil Club. While the syndicate could view their marketing campaign as a resounding success, white residents in neighboring Somerset, Chevy Chase, and Friendship Heights saw these ads differently. The reaction was extreme. Richard Awe, a landowner in Friendship Heights, told the Washington Times... No Negro shall ever build a house in Belmont. I speak for 500 men as determined as I am myself. We do not care what methods are needed to prevent a calamity which appears to be impending. Whatever they are, those methods will be taken. To establish a Negro colony of Belmont practically at our doors and beyond the restraint of the district police force would mean the impairment of our property values, a constant menace to our peace and security, and the destruction of the happiness of our homes. For three weeks, tensions escalated. There was even talk of a clan-like mob and mass rallies of white neighbors. Finally, the neighboring village of Somerset had Satterwhite arrested, facing trial on Judge Lothborough's white-pillared porch. But the mob violence and the arrest did not work. 
the Belmont Syndicate continued to sell lots slowly but steadily until April 1907. Abruptly that month, multiple newspapers reported that Satterwhite sold his share of the syndicate to a white New Yorker. In July, the Washington Herald announced that Dumas had begun a lawsuit alleging that Satterwhite's sale prevented him from credibly selling the property. Finally, in November 1907, both black and white newspapers reported that the previous owners of the Belmont parcel were refusing to close the sale. And then silence in the papers again until the subdivision known as Belmont was erased by a Maryland court in 1926. What was known about Belmont was passed down through snippets and rumors. The way Belmont was the topic of the town for a month and then almost disappeared from history suggests that the story is much deeper and bigger than it looked. To figure out what actually happened, we had to pick up where the newspapers left off. We needed to look at the land deeds. And we needed to look at the lawsuit Michelle Dumas filed. If you know anything about how segregation worked in the United States, you might be saying to yourself that the deeds have racial covenants in them. Covenants are agreements. Think of the covenants in the Bible, made in the documents used to transfer land from one person or company to another. The purchaser agrees to do or not do something with the land or face a penalty in court. Importantly, covenants become part of the property and everyone who purchases the land for years afterwards has to agree to those terms. In a sense, these covenants are as essential to the value of a home site as roads and water. They are fundamental to the character of modern suburbia and indeed, the Belmont Syndicate advertised that the homes of their black buyers would be restricted, that is, protected by non-racial covenants. Racial covenants are promises that the owner of land will not sell, rent, or lease property to certain racial groups. They almost universally excluded black people, but these restrictions targeted any group not deemed white by local custom, such as Chinese, Japanese, Mexican, Jewish, and in the case of Spring Valley in DC, Armenians. Developers began using racial covenants as early as the 1840s, and they spread as Asian wealth rose in the Pacific coast before settling into best practices for realtors in the 1920s. Already in 1906, they were not uncommon in DC. For example, we see them in Martin's Editions next to Chevy Chase, and then in Capitol Heights in Prince George's County. The Supreme Court deemed racially restrictive covenants unenforceable in court in 1948. Covenants still exist and have only become more sophisticated and common and are used both to create very exclusive homeowners associations and guarantee that apartments stay affordable. However, when we examine the deeds selling Belmont to the syndicate, we don't see racial covenants. All we see are restrictions on use. The same is true for lots sold in Chevy Chase at the time, though the covenants are much stricter. This might lead you to believe that the founders of the Chevy Chase Land Company were not opposed to African Americans moving in. We may look at the census records for Chevy Chase in 1910 and there are no black homeowners. Was this just a natural pattern of people wanting to live with other people like them and that's why Belmont failed? The answer is no. The founder of Chevy Chase, Francis Newlands, was an avowed white supremacist, specifically opposed to integration. Writing in 1909 to the Reno Gazette, to justify a series of anti-Japanese laws in West Coast states, he explained, History teaches us that it's impossible to make a homogenous people by the juxtaposition of races differing in color upon the same soil, that under such conditions race tolerance means an undesirable race amalgamation, and that race intolerance ultimately means race war or the reduction of one race to servitude. For Newlands, America faced three apparently equally undesirable fates race war, slavery, or Tiger Woods. He went on to outline an agenda for state and national governments to adopt. The Southern states should recognize that blacks are a race of children requiring guidance, industrial training, and the development of self-control and other measures intended to reduce the danger of race complication. To preserve America as a homeland for the white race, in 1905, Newlands advocated paid resettlement of black people to Cuba, which was controlled by the United States at the time. Newlands' views were not mainstream during his career in the Senate or the House. As late as 1903, representatives brought bills to the floor of Congress seeking punitive reductions in representation for Southern states that disenfranchised black citizens. But in 1912, Newlands attempted to have the Democratic Party endorse the termination of African-American voting rights and was the sole vote in favor. So why did this visionary white supremacist not use one of the most ironclad tools of segregation? It's likely 
and that he and his colleagues believed such restrictions were unconstitutional. Newlands rose to prominence in San Francisco, where a few legal cases had firmly upheld the property rights of non-white people just before Chevy Chase was founded. We can turn to archival documents to see another reason. Besides constitutionality, the developer of the Tony Baltimore suburb of Roland Park avoided racial covenants on the advice of his lawyers, who worried that the restrictions would be an embarrassment that symbolically infringed on constitutional rights and could invalidate the other less controversial covenants. Chevy Chase wanted to attract politicians and business owners. You have to imagine that congressmen ostensibly protecting African Americans might not want to be found living in a house with such embarrassing restrictions. Concern about reputation and loss of stability may explain why high-end suburbs around Chevy Chase, such as Drummond and Somerset, did not use racial covenants in 1906, but a subdivision aimed at working-class buyers like Capitol Heights not only included racial restrictions but flaunted white people only as the top line of a full-page display ad that same year. So how did Chevy Chase ensure that it remained exclusive and lily white, including eliminating Belmont? For this, we had to combine archival documents with academic research about early suburbs. What we found is that they took advantage of the common law rights of private property and structural racism to exclude African Americans as part of a broader exclusion of undesirable uses and undesirable people. In this way, the practices of the Chevy Chase Land Company were not so unusual. It's important to understand how the history is pieced together. In racial covenants, the segregationist intent is written in black and white they are archived at the moment of creation, and they are seen routinely in the course of buying and selling land. Other forms of discrimination don't leave a paper trail. They are part of a constellation of techniques used to ensure that the value of a house in terms of both money and use steadily grows. Excluding racial groups was the most consistent but hardly the only goal of these exclusion techniques. As the scholar Robert Fogelson says about developers like the Chevy Chase Land Company and even the Belmont Syndicate, the subdividers were selling permanents, or to put it another way, they were exploiting the growing fear of unwanted change. This change was on the mind of Francis Newlands. Newland saw a pattern. The wealthy would build homes upwind of the filth, smoke, and other nuisances that characterized cities at the time. Over time, less desirable uses like row houses, apartment buildings, and hotels would move into wealthy areas and diminish the value and exclusivity of neighborhoods. Eventually, businesses, industry, the poor, and non-white people would follow. To stop this pattern from affecting the land he controlled, Newlands established a network of companies all owned by the same people that worked together to control access to the land over the long term. The Chevy Chase Land Company was the primary holding company. The Rock Creek Railway Company made the land convenient. A brokerage called the Thomas J. Fisher Company sold the land, and the Union Trust Bank was used for large-scale financing, particularly using an instrument called a deed of trust. The first way this organization excluded potential buyers was through high prices. The land in Chevy Chase was many times more expensive than suburbs elsewhere. On top of that, the land company required that houses built on lots be too expensive for all but the wealthy. This excluded most white people, but because African Americans had even less access to wealth, it was even more airtight for keeping black people out. In this way, racism built into society as a whole, structural racism, enabled exclusion that was, at face value, neutral, just classist. But would trying to buy a house in a white neighborhood really be worth it for a wealthy black person in 1906? The respectability of the black elite in broader white society was fragile, depending on unspoken rules about not upsetting the racial order. We can see this just a few years later, when a wealthy black lawyer in Baltimore moved into a white neighborhood. It caused a scandal. He faced threats, and the city abandoned all appearances of equality and passed a law setting aside parts of the city for different races, much like apartheid South Africa. This is the second form of exclusion that elite suburbs could depend on, unwritten social norms. If one of the small numbers of rich black Washingtonians was bold enough to walk into the sales office of the Thomas Fisher Company, up the block from the White House, they would likely have found themselves turned away at the door. This is the third method of exclusion, discrimination at the point of sale. Until 1967, it was fully legal in Montgomery County to refuse to sell to African Americans simply because of their race. But this sort of discrimination doesn't leave a paper trail. Instead, we have to piece it together. 
There were no black homeowners in Chevy Chase in 1910. The Thomas Fisher companies did not advertise at all in DC's African-American papers. And in a court case, the Chevy Chase organization lawyers indicated that they would not have sold to the Belmont Syndicate had they known who was buying. But the thing that Newlands, his peers, and their purchasers feared the most was change over the long term. So to protect against undesirable uses in lower class residents, they would use non-racial deed covenants, which became part of the property. There was one other technique the Chevy Chase organization used to ensure its vision was upheld even after the land passed from its hands. This is the deed of trust. Now, bear with us, this one is a little confusing and it's not quite used this way in 2021. A deed of trust was used to transfer real estate to an ostensibly neutral third party until the purchaser repaid a loan, similar to a mortgage. Like covenants, trust deeds became part of the property and limited the purchaser's rights. To fully own the property, the buyer had to get a full release from the deed of trust, which involved paying back the loan and meeting other conditions that they agreed to. In the case of the 31-acre parcel called Belmont, it was the Union Trust and another partnership who determined whether the Belmont Syndicate had repaid the loans and met the conditions. The deed of trust therefore also functioned as a stopgap. If a purchaser defaulted on their loan, Union Trust could go to court to push for a foreclosure auction. Court documents held at the Maryland State Archives show that it was the deeds of trust that undid the Belmont Syndicate. Two court cases initiated by Michelle Dumas show that when the Belmont Syndicate asked for the deeds to be released, they were denied. As time dragged on, additional payments for the deed of trust came due, and the Belmont Syndicate no longer had adequate cash flow because people had become hesitant to buy. In February 1909, the Union Trust Bank foreclosed on Belmont, auctioning the land to an agent of the Chevy Chase Land Company. But 20 lots were left in limbo by the litigation Dumas had initiated. The cases would not be settled until Halloween 1925 in a private agreement among Michelle Dumas, Barnard & Johnson, and the Chevy Chase organization. Dumas finally withdrew his litigation, and in 1926, the Chevy Chase Land Company extinguished the Belmont subdivision. So it was not racial covenants or any of the threats of violence that did in the Belmont Syndicate. It was instead modern legal tools of exclusion, reinforcing each other within an unequal society that prevented Belmont from disrupting the vision of an ironclad white Northwest Washington, which has now become a favored quarter just as Francis Newlands envisioned. The Washington Bee said of Belmont in 1907 that, Never again will colored men control a suburb in the Northwest section of Washington. That remains essentially true to this day. But many African Americans remained as interested in the suburbs as white people of the same economic situation. And the history of African-American suburbs that were eventually built reveals what makes Belmont important. Now, there have always been black people on the periphery of cities, but the black suburbs of the 20th century are more like Chevy Chase than those semi-rural areas. Homeowners could have access to the benefits of a city, but not its downsides. Beginning in 1906, W. Sidney Pittman, a black architect in D.C. who was also Booker T. Washington's son-in-law, began promoting the area of Fairmount Heights in Prince George's County, drawing generous coverage in the black press. But that development had first been laid out by two white lawyers, and those properties did not use any covenants to preserve the character of the subdivision. While homeowners formed a citizens association and levied member fees for improvements, sales were slow until a streetcar service called the Washington, Baltimore and Annapolis Railroad, or the WBNA, made the area more convenient in 1908. Lincoln, Maryland, located further out the WBNA, opened the same year and was a more sophisticated effort at suburbanization. By 1915, the developers had provided a running water system and lured a prestigious church. A prominent black lawyer and classmate of James Neal at Fisk named Thomas J. Calloway promoted the suburb, although it seems to have had close ties to a white-owned developer called the United States Realty Company. And furthermore, it deliberately avoided upsetting social norms, accepting its place far from Northwest. Indeed, In an advertisement in the African-American magazine, The Crisis, Calloway argued that it was better to self-segregate in a nice suburban community rather than face hostility with attempts to integrate. The reputation of the WBNA as a corridor for African-American suburbanization had grown clear by 1913. That year, a white landowner founded Glenarden and Glenarden Heights. Like Lincoln, its streets converged at a green around the streetcar station. Unlike Lincoln, Glenarden lacked running water and recreational amenities before agitation by the Civic Association in the 1920s. 
Their work to secure public services from an uninterested county would lead to the incorporation of the town in 1939. Of course, black suburban development in the early 20th century was not limited to D.C. John Mitchell Jr., the owner of the Richmond Planet, used his newspaper to promote black homeownership in the capital of Virginia because he knew home ownership was fundamental to black self-reliance and economic freedom. At the turn of the 20th century, Mitchell ran ads for the subdivision of Woodville, located right outside the city's limits on the streetcar line, as the colored man's paradise. Maggie Walker, an African-American banker in Richmond, purchased land near the historically black Virginia Union University and laid out Frederick Douglass Court in 1919, a streetcar suburb for educated and fashionable black Richmonders. But Douglass Court never developed as it was intended. Few people, including Walker, took the model houses or financing. Black developers found more success in the suburbs around Baltimore, Maryland. In 1909, Cherry Heights, located at the end of a streetcar in Baltimore County, was developed by an AME minister named John Hurst and a one-time assistant librarian of Congress, Daniel A.P. Murray. Cherry Heights directly compared the finer lots in this first-class property to those of elite white Roland Park. Indeed, like Roland Park, Cherry Heights employed a robust set of covenants on nuisances and required the construction of a fairly expensive house. Also in Baltimore, the self-made black financier Harry O. Wilson acquired a 19-acre property near Roland Park in 1917 and named it Wilson Park. Advertisements flaunted its desirable location, good drainage, act, transit access, and association with Wilson, who was something of a local luminary. However, it did not employ covenants of any kind. The same year, trustees of the historically black Morgan State University established Morgan Park, which consisted of 129 lots on curving streets. The developers provided water, electricity, and sewer service and protected its character, including its racial compatibility, with a long and fully modern set of covenants. All of these suburbs exist to this day. Belmont, on the other hand, was reduced to a rumor about a settlement for black servants. If Alexander Satterwhite, Michelle Dumas, James Neal, and Charles Cuny had not been stopped, Belmont would have been a key moment in the history of suburbanization. Unlike most suburbs for black people of that era, it was developed by African Americans. Its lots sold for above average costs in the most desirable part of Washington, D.C., and was marketed to an upwardly mobile clientele. They attempted to use modern exclusionary tools earlier than any other African American development. Locally, Belmont would have led to a dramatically different racial geography around D.C. The suburbs along the WBNA streetcar formed the seat of Prince George's County's well-known black affluence. In a different world, that might have been Wisconsin Avenue. The men who planned Belmont carried a mindset of reconstruction, hopeful, ambitious, and eager for the same success as their white competitors. They were some of the first African Americans to try to shape the suburbs, and they were also some of the first to learn that they were not welcome. <laughs>